We're in Siman Reish Samech Tet. We're finishing up the laws of conversion. Most of this is not so relevant for us. I just want to do the first halakha so we get a taste of what's going on here. It's the, the second Siman. Isur Arayot Begerim. Vidinan Linan Edut V'chalitza. The prohibited sexual relations of, non, of, of converts to Judaism and what their status is regarding being witnesses and marrying the siblings, sis, uh, wives, so on and so forth. I'll explain. When a person converts to Judaism, a rabbi tells Ger Shunit Ger, a convert who converts, Kikatan Shunolad Dami, is like a baby that's being born. Meaning he is a new person, reborn, literally, reborn, and he has no family. He has relatives that are, are his uh, biological family, but on a, on a spiritual halachic level, he's not related to anyone anymore. He, and whoever he marries and has children with from then on, he starts a new lineage, literally. But, but at this point in time, he has no family. And that works in a, a number of different directions. Can he marry his mother? Can he marry his sister? His child? Can two brothers who convert be witnesses in the same bedin on a case? Or do we say they still have a conflict of interest? Oh, so if they can't marry each other, or they can marry each other, can a father go to his daughter's house and sleep there for the night, or is that already yichud, a prohibited uh, place to be? These are real halakha questions that come up. Chalitza, is this the same chalitza as the shimser? Yeah, very, exactly. I mean, is he obligated to marry his brother's wife, or I mean, is that who doesn't have any children? I mean, how far do you take this? The a person who converts is a new person. So says Maran Din Torah, according to the basic law of the Torah, he's allowed to marry his mother or his sister from his mother. Once they, once they convert to Judaism also. I mean, they all are not related, are individuals. I know, in a, kidding. A rabbi is prohibited such a thing. So people shouldn't say, We came from a holier place to a less holy place. It can't be that he becomes Jewish and now he can do things that are unthinkable even when he was a non-Jew. And also there's the, there would be the ex post facto question of, did this person convert so that something like this would be possible? Oh, interesting. Okay, true. But Chachamim are worried about this concept of it cannot be that a person is less holy now once they're Jewish than they were before. And there are many halachot that come up like this. Yeah. Things that technically might be allowed to a person who converted, but it can't be that he was not allowed to before and now he is allowed. The same thing as if a person actually goes ahead and has relationships. That's not our, not, not what I want to deal with today. Relationships. Now, what happens if he's married already to his mother or his sister? He lives in some non Jewish society where that's allowed. New Guinea. Yeah? Okay. Unfortunately. And now he converts to Judaism. Is he allowed to stay married? Like, do we respect the fact that he was in the previous relationship? We, we, we don't let them. They, they have to separate. Part of the conditions of converting is such a thing. They're married to a non-Jew and they convert. Their non-Jewish wife has to convert with them. It's one of my Shavuot cases. What about a guy who wants to... Let me ask you this question. What about the status of two twin brothers? One converts. Who were conceived while they were non-Jewish, when the mother was non-Jewish. She converts while she's pregnant. Are they born Jews? Are they born related to her? Are they born related to each other? Do they have to go through their own conversion? Do we go based on conception or birth? We said already last time, we studied that it goes based on conception, uh, on birth. So they're born Jews. Can they be witnesses for each other? Suffice to say in Halakha is if they were born Jewish, they have all the laws of any other two brothers in the world. But the conception is not really so relevant to us in Halakha, at least not in these Halakhot. Witnesses. They can be witnesses for each other. They are able to be witnesses for each other. Because 
and we really believe that they're born again. And so we allow them to be witnesses for each other. Hmm. The question is, but maybe the Jews will learn and say, oh, two brothers are witnesses in Beit Din. Maybe we could also have two brothers witnesses in Beit Din. The logic here is interesting. Normally we would say such a thing, like, oh, you can't mix the pot on the stovetop on Shabbat because someone might see you and think that uh, you can cook on Shabbat. Here no, that doesn't something. apply because we're talking about a Bedin. Who's judging? The Bedin. Uh, a Bedin should know Halakhot. That's why they're a Bedin. And therefore we're not worried about the Bedin yes. not knowing the Halakha, learning the wrong thing from them. I wanted just to switch to, to another part of this book. It's not in Shulchan Aruch itself, but... If a non-Jewish man and his wife had children while they were non-Jews and the whole family converts to Judaism him and his wife and his boy and his girl they all convert to Judaism together has he fulfilled his mitzvah of having being fruitful and multiplying? Oh wow, what a great question I would love by the way to dwell on these topics because they're great topics but I want to just go through some of these the things I don't think we all thought about before I learned this I never thought about these questions either um, according to Shulchan Aruch and Ibn Ezzah if they all convert together he has fulfilled his obligation of being fruitful multiply even though they're technically not all related to each other but he brought in a boy and a girl into the Jewish faith and that was that's his family but but if they don't convert with him and they stay non-Jews, then he ha- he is obligated again in having children. They're not technically related to each other because they have new identities per se as Jews. So that means the wife, the husband, and the two children are not technically by Jewish law related to each other. When that son will get an aliyah to the Torah, he will not use his father's name. He'll say, Benjamin Ban Abraham. Though it's not so simple. There are cases where we're... Li- uh, this is all when we're talking in, in square technical halachic terms. There are obviously personal issues that come up, emotional issues. I, I raise, I'm still raising the child. I'm paying his Jewish education. Why can't he get Aliyah's bar mitzvah with my name? Okay, that obviously is, um, you know, Aliyah's bar mitzvah is not a halakha. You can do whatever you want with that name. Um, but technically, t- we're talking here in a technical term. Because halachically, we have to establish boundaries. And Why so here, doesn't he have to remarry his wife, though? He does remarry his wife. He marries her in a Jewish ceremony. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. And, okay. and th- then they are related to each other. The, hu- the husband and the wife. Yes, but not the yes, kids. Yes, not the kids. There's a couple I know that converted. Um, I don't know, no, when they finally had their final day of conversion, when I mean, they came up to the day of the conversion, they when they went up to uh, L.A., they... Had a cake waiting for them. See, that's interesting because a technically there's cake. a period of time that they have to separate for. Right. Uh, but okay, I'm. I'm Even on the Sephardim too? There's not a Sephardic Ashkenazi thing, mostly a, a practical do they live together, do they sleep together, there are all kinds of questions that come up here. A non Jewish man who converts, or a woman who converts, her parents that are not Jewish, or his parents that are not Jewish, does he have an obligation to respect them, not as a decent person? I mean, does he have an obligation to respect them on a kibbut avaim level? Because technically, in Jewish law, he doesn't have parents. What about, it'd be like the law of the orphan who's raised, who's adopted and raised. They, don't they still have kibbut avaim? Okay, so here we have, Gel, says Maran, a convert, Asur lekalel aviv agoy. He's not allowed to curse his non-Jewish father. Like, Koto, he can't hit him. Vulei vazel, he can't even um, say mean things to him. I mean, he, uh, he can't do... Uh, just like he can't do to his Jewish parents. Shlo so people can't say, Banu mikdusha chamua mikdusha kala. Again, it can't be that when I was non-Jewish, I had to respect my parents. And now that I'm Jewish, I could throw them to the curb. You know, it doesn't work that way. And is the Tariag mitzvot of... Mitzvah of honoring your parents, isn't that for Jew and non-Jew, really? It's a good question. Here we're talking about, again, a technical, not on, on a moral, ethical level, on a technical level, on a halachic level. Is it an obligation? If he if he hits his father in Jewish law, he might actually, all kinds of penalties happen to that. If he hits his non-Jewish father, is it the same thing? Here we're saying it is. He's not allowed to. The same thing regarding his mother, by the way. It's not a difference uh, between the father and the mother.
parents brings down the Abraham ibn Ezra. A beautiful piece. Remember when the lady who's captured in war and she ends up marrying the Jewish man who captured her. And we say that she sits and she for a whole month she mourns her parents. Rav Avram Ibn Ezra writes, Lefidati, according to my opinion. I mean, it's not something I found in the Talmud. It's not something I found in my understanding of his verses. So the Rambam once told Rabbi Hassan, Rabbi Abraham, leave all the commentaries alone. Leave all the books alone and just study Rabbi Avram Ibn Ezra. He is the one to study. Lefidati, according to my opinion, Chayav kol adam b'shikul dad. Every person has to use his dad as his basic human humanity that he has in him. It doesn't make him he's Jewish or not Jewish. To respect his parents both while they're alive and after they're passing. And the reason why the Torah says that this lady who's converting to Judaism must cry for her parents. She's now Jewish and as a Jew she must mourn her parents. <coughs> if she was, if they were killed while she was captured, meaning the assumption is they were all murdered and the, these women were taken as cap- prisoners of war. And is this uh, derived from the law when you capture someone in war and yes, one has a shaver and grow her yes, nails yes, 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 in the same situation. Parents. But what Rabbi Avraham is reading into this is there's basic human decency that Torah demands from anybody, and it can't be that when a person converts to Judaism they lose their basic human decency. It cannot happen that way. It's for that reason that we write that Kaddish, a person's allowed to say Kaddish over their parents that are not Jewish. I once heard a, a fool say that you're not allowed to. I told you someone if, who dropped out of observance altogether because he had to hide in, in this community, he had to hide that he was mourning his mother. He wasn't allowed to express it and lo- it ended up destroying his marriage. A human being life. is a human being. A parent is lost. A parent is lost. Halakhically, I, we had a, a case. Halakhically, there are certain things that, that we, I'm not going to say we because we should never have to go through that that people have to do when they they lose a, a relative and many of those things are done not out of res- they're not done to elevate the neshama of that who passed but it's almost like a social norm that is expected to respect it can't be that a, a parent passes away and the next day someone's dancing it away because the neshama said, but there are some cultures where maybe they throw a party there are all kinds of cultures out there in the world and if someone's parents came from that culture they were not Jewish then their parents, when they passed away, didn't expect them to mourn them in the fashion of not partying or not going to a wedding. Saying Kaddish is a, is a Jew. There's no one in that family to say Kaddish for the non-Jewish parent. Of course that the child has an obligation to say Kaddish. Everyone else is busy going to church. Or going, this one is the only son who can actually elevate the neshama. It's yeah. the contrary of what everybody thinks. Not shaving, not getting a haircut. Those things are social norms. In the Jewish community, a person who didn't shave, didn't get a haircut... Don't try to justify this then with, with the Kabbalistic concept of growing a beard your whole life. Don't, I, I can't help you with that. The custom of having an unkempt look to oneself is a social sign of mourning. And therefore, that might not be an obligation for a person who loses a non-Jewish parent. It's not a zilzul, it's not a, a degradation to the parent. If you go to the non-Jew world and say, oh, do, do, do people shave after they lose their parents? They, they don't know what you want from their life. Of course they shave. Why would they shave? They shower? Of course they shower. They change clothes? Of course they change clothes. There are certain things that we take upon ourselves as Jews. It's expected by the person who passed to respect them in a certain way. But there are other things that are objective. They're not subjective to the society which they came from. Kaddish, doing a, a your side, a yisko, a askara, by the neshama, on the Torah. All these things we do. If anything, this is the child that can. Our parent says at the end of the day, this is the parent that brought you to the world. It didn't just bring you to the world, but brought you to the Jewish faith. If it wasn't for this parent, you wouldn't be Jewish. Mm-hmm. And if there could be, for one moment, a community leader who feels the other way, they're, they're not just grossly mistaken, but it's Chilul Hashem that knows no bounds. I told you about this one prominent teacher who was a convert, or, but we also talked about the nature of the conversion, but that he told his own children that his parents died in the Holocaust. And, and it wasn't true? No, they were non-Jews. What do you mean? In other words, he converted, and his parents were not Jewish, so he told he grew up because he, he didn't want them to know. He was he, in like a very Haredi community. He didn't want them to know about his real parents. Yeah, I can't, told them that they I, died in the Holocaust. That they I can't were. help people who who. Um, I'm, I'm biting my tongue. It's a little terrible. Well, yeah. What about this? What a person is a firstborn? They become Jewish. 
Do they have to fast the fast of the firstborn in Erev Pesach? <laughs> to become Jewish. They converted to Judaism. They were born a firstborn to their non-Jewish mother. Well, I'll throw it in. Their father was Jewish, meaning they were inclined to Judaism always. So I don't know the answer to it better, but it seems that they should. But uh, or with the first convert. Why do we fast in the fast of the firstborn? To remind us of what happened in Eretz Israel. That's right. That what? That the firstborn all died, but the Jews were spared. Very good. So in, in this case, he doesn't have that. I mean, it, it's not like, oh, he was Jewish and he was spared. and he's not. This, this fast is not relevant to him. He doesn't have to fast. It's not written anywhere in Halakha, but that's the, what I've heard his opinion is. It doesn't have to fast. Are there different opinions? I haven't seen anyone else talk about it, actually, so I, I can't answer that question. Oh, I just want to read to you uh, from Rav Peretz himself. A convert is allowed to have yichud and be secluded with his family members. Whether they convert or not. The law of him and his family is the same thing as a Jew with his family. He could have consistent yichud with his mother and his grandmothers. Yeah? And with his great-grandmother, and with his daughter, and with his great-granddaughter, the granddaughter from his son or his daughter, I don't know if many people sister. know this halakha. A Jew is not allowed to consistently live with his sister. He's allowed to go visit and stay for a Shabbat and go, but not to actually... A brother and a sister can't rent an apartment and live together. After what age? I, I, don't, I don't know the exact numbers here. It's a good question. Meaning, uh, when they're little children, when they're... The understanding is that brothers and sisters are... are they're obviously siblings, and there are certain yetzahahs that don't exist, but there are other yetzahahs that could exist, and, and Chazal wanted certain things separate. So he's allowed to with his sister also, but in, in non-consistent uh, fashions. And with his aunts, on both his mother's aunt and his father's aunt. The reason is, it's the Teva HaAdam. The Teva is that even if I convert or not, I still don't have Yetzan for my mother now that I'm Jewish. Nothing changed on a Yetzan level. And because Yichud exists only to protect us from Yetzan there's no worry here. The, the question I would have would be, is a, nesh, is a change in neshama, which changes your relationship to your former blood family members, does that change how the person views a sister, a mother, a grandmother? I, I mean, think that if we would ask someone to convert to Judaism, they would tell you no. Probably. I mean, the same repulsion of marrying one's mother wouldn't change whether she's Jewish or not. I think, uh, yeah, we have to ask, but I'm, I'm assuming that it doesn't change. And so are Chazal. And if Peretz writes in the beginning, This is a very personal moment there, but I originally thought, That so I originally thought, Rav Peretz said, that my original thought was that a convert can only be in Yehud with someone who is rabbinically prohibited to him but not biblically. And then he said, after he saw that Rav Moshe Feinstein was leaning to Badis, I also had the audacity to write this in my book. And our parents was very much convinced that once a big person like Rav Moshe Feinstein said it was okay, he could also say it was okay. Originally he was afraid, and Rav Moshe calmed him down. There are such things. So then I ask your parents a question, he'll say, someone big should... Say it, and then I'll. Uh, there's a way for the world to work like that. And 